Hello, everyone. Let's give uh, one more minute and we'll get started, okay? We'll be starting very shortly. Thank you. Okay, I see there are still a few people joining us, but we should we should get started here on time. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Roberto Simon. I'm a senior director of policy at America Society Council of the Americas and the head of our anti-corruption group. Uh, I'm also the co-author of the Capacity to Combat Corruption Index, the CCC Index. Uh, we're thrilled to have this very special group of panelists today. Um, to discuss the, the state of anti-corruption in Mexico based on some of the CCC index findings. Um, before I present them, uh, let me start with a few important reminders. Um, first, for those of you joining us uh, on the WebEx, uh, please keep your microphones on mute all the time. Um, for those of you, some of uh, are also joining us through the, our social media uh, platforms. This panel is on the record and it's being live streamed. Um, so, and we will have a Q&A at the end, a Q&A session. If you're on the WebEx platform, please use the chat box on the right side of your screen to ask questions. Um, if you're following us on social media, please use the, the hashtag ASCOA or America's Quarterly. Uh, this event is sponsored by Control Risks, which is also the co-developer of the CCC Index. My co-author in the report was uh, Geert Albers, a partner who is also present here today. Uh, we're also very grateful to other sponsors of our anti-corruption working group, um, CFA Institute, Millicom, and Clear and Gottlieb. Uh, we will have other events looking at specific countries uh, and discussing uh, them based on the CCC index findings. Uh, next week on Wednesday, 9 a.m. East, we'll have an event dedicated to Brazil. And on the following week, uh, one event dedicated to Peru. Um, as I said, today we have a very interesting group of experts on anti-corruption, all of them based in Mexico. Uh, Mexico City, more specifically, to, to discuss with us uh, what's going on on the ground in Mexico. Uh, Mariana Campos is the Public Expenditure Program Coordinator at Mexico Evalua. Uh, Pablo Montes is the Anti-Corruption Coordinator at the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, IMCO. And Francisco Garcia is a control risk analyst focusing on political risk and corruption. Before we get started uh, with the discussion, let me just very quickly uh, present, present everyone um, some of the findings that we have for Mexico. Um, you guys can see the screen, right? I'm sharing my screen here. Very quick PowerPoint presentation uh, just to get started with the discussion. So basically, Mexico ranks uh, in eighth place uh, in our overall ranking. You see here the full list. We cover the 15 largest economies in Latin America. Mexico is behind countries like Colombia, Argentina, Peru, and Brazil uh, with the, the score uh, 4.55 out of 10. Um, when you compare Mexico's score uh, this year, 2020, to the score last year, we haven't seen any significant changes, right? Despite the fact that AMLO has really focused on, on anti-corruption and anti-corruption has remained really at the center of the government's agenda, a major topic for Congress, et cetera, the score hasn't really changed. If you compare, for instance, to the score, to Brazil's score, Brazil had a, almost a 10% drop between uh, 2019 and 2020. Peru has uh, something like a 6% improvement, uh, but, you know, 
Mexico had a slight variation, but nothing really dramatic. We consider that the, the, the score is stable since last year. The index is composed of three subcategories, uh, one that we call legal capacity, basically the legal tools to fight corruption. The second one is democracy and political institutions. And the third one is civil society, media, and the private sector. You can see the legal capacity here, the purple chart. When you look at Mexico, Mexico is a at a similar level than, than countries like Ecuador, Panama, or even Guatemala. If you look at the state of democracy and political institutions in Mexico, you see that actually Mexico is really close to countries like Brazil and Peru. And I think civil society is kind of the, the really positive side of the story where Mexico ranks uh, above Colombia, above uh, uh, Peru, for instance, and close to, to Brazil. Um, finally, this I promise is this, the last slide. We have the 14 variables here that the CCC index assesses. What is important here, it's to look at um, the average for the 15 scores are, and where Mexico stands, right? And you see that in several areas, Mexico is behind uh, or below the, the regional average, right? In, in critical areas like the, the independence or inefficiency of courts, or the strength of anti-corruption agencies, but also regarding the overall quality of democracy, lawmaking, and ruling processes. But again, we also have some really positive uh, areas. Uh, you can see, for instance, that civil society mobilization against corruption in Mexico is significantly above uh, the regional average. In some areas in the legal capacity, such as government transparency, Mexico is also above uh, the regional average. If you want to learn more, or if you want, if you have questions about the um, the methodology of the index, or you want to check other countries, the report is available on the ASCOA uh, website and on America's Quarterly as well. Reach out with questions. But I think it would be interesting to start by going around the room, or or going around the virtual room in this case. Just asking you guys, uh, kind of your reaction to this basic findings of the CCC index. Do, are you surprised by anything? Uh, were you, you know, do you disagree with with some of the results? Uh, let me start with Mariana Campos. Mariana, thanks again for for joining us. What is your reaction to our findings? Well, um, my reaction is that I don't really feel surprised of what I see. I, I suspect many could feel surprised because you know that Mexico has always been recognized like a, a leader or a, yeah, a, a leader in America Latina um, in a region, an important country, not only by the size of its territory, the population, and many of uh, past economic reforms that Mexico did on time, or, or with better opportunity than other competing countries in America Latina. So it, it has always been recognized with a special part in the, in the region. And uh, I think that if you don't really know about the quality of our institutions and the core challenges that we are facing right now in our country to tackle corruption, you might get surprised like why Mexico is so below um, and and I think that, but for the experts um, or, or the people that we work daily with these topics, uh, I don't feel surprised. And I'm I'm gonna just mention two things. The um, it's very frequent, for example, in the in the purple uh, section where we are, um, you guys are assessing capacity, institutional capacity, and legal capacity. I see that, that that it's very frequent that we are low in the in, in the aspects related to the independence of different institutions, and also uh, we lack some instruments. I think that that doesn't surprise me because I believe that we are very very. Uh, um, lagged in the generation of a real civil service in very key institutions. And I think that is a topic that a topic that has been uh, addressed, but not really, and discussed, but not really deeply as we should. So uh, 
I think that is, uh, uh, it's a, a great challenge right now. And I think that our anti-corruption system at this time is interrupted because we just changed um, the term of a go uh, uh, for a new government, you know? One government just ended in 2018. We are in a new government that is gonna be uh, ruling for six years. And we don't really have real a real civil service. People usually go out with uh, the group of people that are really managing uh, or, and taking decisions every six years. And we lose a lot of experience and we lose also, and we don't have the real incentives to keep the plans and the institutions alive or the same plans and the same mo uh, motivations. So we really need to tackle that in Mexico. And I think it's uh, a very, um, not attractive topic or sexy topic to to talk about in the public opinion, but it's in the in the um, we have a lot of corruption in the payment of taxes, and I and I and I think we are also missing a real ser um, fiscal service um, of. Um, you know, civil servants that are really uh, professional and that can actually um, keep up with the institutional um, objectives. So, Mariana highlighted the, the, the challenge of human capital, I would put it, to, to really have a functioning government, a government that can better detect, punish, and prevent corruption. Francisco, what is your reaction to the CCC index findings? Francisco was one of the collaborators uh, re who responded for a survey for, for uh, Mexico specifically. Pablo was the other. Um, so what is your reaction here? Are you surprised with the end results? Uh, my reaction was mostly directed at how the result for 2020 shows how they there was a very high expectation for the heavy anti-corruption element in President López Obrador's campaign and even his rhetoric in the first year or so of his, of his government. And even though there haven't been, been any legislative or, or you know, changes on the, on, the, on the legal side of things, the decrease in Mexico's score shows how these high expectations were simply not met. And there is an element of how it's unlikely that AMLO will, will pursue a true anti-corruption effort after we can, in retrospect, tell how what was touched upon in his campaign was not necessarily solid on the institutional front. It was very much from the perspective of it's going to get better because it's me and I'm better. And this type of perspective is, does not give us the same kind of predictability that at least in the private sector from the compliance part of, the, of this discussion is more heavily valued. Pablo, let me bring you into the discussion here. What, what is your reaction? I, I completely agree with, with Mariana and Francisco. While it may be, for many it may come as a surprise that Mexico was low given Lopez Obrador's a strong rhetoric towards corruption. Uh, it's been at least a surprise that's been breaking uh, little by little since the beginning of Lopez Obrador administration. Um, I think the main problem we're facing in Mexico right now, and it was the same in past administrations and also highlighted by, by the report, is the independ independence of anti-corruption institutions. Um, curbing corruption cannot be constrained by the thoughts and beliefs of the executive. And while with President uh, Peña Nieto, there was really a free for all uh, uh, like a permit for corruption, with Lopez Obrador, at least in the rhetoric, it, uh, we started seeing some really strong stance uh, against corruption. But unfortunately, we have seen that this is a hollow discourse, a hollow speech, and that the, at least the first actions towards corruption has been first a misconception between controlling corruption and austerity. Many of the anti-corruption efforts of Lopez Obrador have been targeted to cutting government uh, spending, which is not essentially anti-corruption. And second, and it's also highlighted uh, in, in some of the reports indicators towards the independence of, of the anti-corruption institutions, 
is that we've started to see a politically motivated use of the anti-corruption investigation. We've seen that most of the cases brought forward by the administration appear to be politically targeted towards cumbersome characters, but at least in the cases that we've seen that are close to the president's circle or close to the president's government, we've seen that there are not clear actions or sanctions. And for Lopez Obrador, at least my reading of, of their administration, and I think that it's pretty well uh, recorded by the, by the index, is that uh, corruption has started to see to be used as a friend or foe element in order to push forward an agenda, but not necessarily uh, a clear anti-corruption agenda. So let, let me go back to a point that you referenced, which is, you know, this big anti-corruption cases, investigations that we're seeing in Mexico, um, such as the Lozoya case, former CEO of Pemex, we have, you know, go former governors now uh, facing charges. We have um, a former secretary of public security, a, a, a corruption scandal that cost the, the job of a Supreme Court justice. Um, how, how do you, why these cases are happening? Basically, this is, if your argument is that, you know, there's not actual independence, not actual prosecution. Basically, you're saying that they are only happening because these people are against the administration. And based on that, what what do you think will happen in in cases such as uh, the the head of Morena's party, uh, who's also now facing a, a big corruption scandal? Can you separate these lines, and and is it that clear, or how do you interpret this? Um, well, I, I think it's not as clear as it may seem, but. Uh, for example, most of the cases, uh, Lozoya, uh, Duarte, both Duartes, um, at least the big cases in Mexico have not started because of government's initiative or for Lopez Obrador initiative. They usually, uh, the result of media investigations, investigative journalism that have found uh, these sort of things and have pushed then the, uh, the investigations forward, or they also come from abroad. The case of, of the former uh, security secretary, security minister, uh, comes from an investigation in the U.S. and pretty much nothing has happened uh, here in Mexico. As well with Lozoya, we've seen that there is a reluctancy of government to really get into the other scandal, maybe because of the, uh, the campaign financing behind it. But we've seen a lot of splashes, but not really some substance. And regarding the, the former Morena head, uh, investigation that uh, that actually uh, it formally initiated today at least. Um, I see that as a power struggle between the party, within the party, and this power struggle was lost by Polensky, and she's now suffering those consequences. But it, you cannot see a clear anti-corruption effort or anti-corruption agenda behind these cases, and they are flashy, and they may uh, give the appearance that something is happening, but actually within those cases, uh, there's been uh, a slow movement and also the motivations uh, don't don't seem pretty clear. And of course, we have the, the case of, of Manuel Bartet, the head of, of the energy uh, state-owned enterprise in Mexico, which uh, seems to be protected by the president uh, himself from any corruption allegation that's been said in the past. And a, a lot of this discussion has also hinged on um, anti-money laundering uh, and particularly the role of WIF, the, the Mexican AML agency. Francisco, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the role that the AML uh, is playing on this. We've seen increased action, you know, a, a spike in number of accounts that have been frozen. Um, the head of AML, the AML agency, Santiago Nieto, is really, you know, a big personality now more present in the newspapers than many ministers and participating in press, press conferences uh, with the president. Um, what is your read of things there? It's clear that there, there is, you know, increased activity, but is it to the benefit of the rule of law? And how, how, how do you interpret this? What I see in this case is that there is a huge element of personal leadership in the in the current state of anti-corruption activity in Mexico. What I mean by that is there, there is a very clear vertical structures in how the government expects this kind of effort to function. While at the same time, and I'd be interested to hear Mariana and Pablo's thoughts on this, 
I feel like there is a there's there are many mentions of independence as something that needs to happen, but there isn't enough of a discussion about what that independence in an institutional context actually looks like. Right. Because from the perspective of companies, the independent institutions make the environment more predictable and allow you to look at the written rules and know that they will be complied with and they and that anything that goes wrong, there is a clear path forward. Whereas from the perspective of a government with a very vertical structure, such as what it seems that President Lopez Obrador is attempting to work with, uh, this type of independence is actually seen the other way around as in, un, an unpredictable government that might go against your rivals, but it, but then it might go against your allies. And this type of situation doesn't allow for much clarity from, from the perspective of, of an, actual anti-corruption efforts, of which, for example, uh, austerity, as Pablo mentioned, is not in itself an anti-corruption effort. And this this leads me to what, what you mentioned about anti-money laundering and fraud. And across Latin America, this increase in investigations focused on fraud and anti-money laundering is usually a, a sign that corruption investigations actually are not being pursued to the whole extent of the information that they may give when anti-corruption investigations boil down to whether if someone lied in a transaction or whether if uh, money is being laundered, it usually means that institutions have their hands tied to an extent. So what I see there is there is a, a willingness by the government to use these tools to pursue specific cases that are politically uh, valuable to them. But it doesn't seem like there is a, a willingness to actually go the full length of what an anti-corruption investigation would look like, even in cases that are, are already being investigated or even in, in courts, even in cases that come from abroad. There doesn't seem to be this, this real willingness to open the can of worms, so to speak. You, you raised a really interesting point, which is centralization versus decentralization, right? It seems to me that starting in around 2015, 16, the anti-corruption discussion in Mexico was about decentralizing kind of anti-corruption controls. And I think the Sistema Nacional Anticorruption was kind of an effort to do that uh, in many ways. But now we're seeing AMLO trying to centralize all controls. And now there's discussion about centralizing regulatory agencies uh, in a national institute for markets and competition for the well-being, right? Mariana, how do you see that in terms of how dramatic is, is the reform of the state and what would be the long-term consequences for not only detecting and punishing corruption, but also preventing corruption from, from taking place? You need to un unmute your mic. Sorry about that. I was saying that I see this like going backwards. It's going to weaken us more, our institutions. I was just saying at the beginning that professionalization um, of our uh, public servants is very important, especially because they, um, they don't have the incentives to really um, work for the institutional objectives sometimes. So Mexico has developed uh, different autonomous institutions along the years to put aside some functions of the state and to grant a better um, performance of, of such uh, institutions, you know, to keep them a little bit like away from the politics and to develop technical skills and capabilities. So it seems that our president um, wants this project of not having this counterbalance and to centralize and, and, and build a more vertical structure. So um, I think that this um, reform, for example, to convert, to transform these three regulators into one is just a proof that he wants to get rid of this counterbalance and to, and he's not giving the proper uh, priority to the, um, what I was telling you, the professionalization, I don't know if it's the, the correct word, of our public servants and institutions. So um, if you see the initiative, they are calling for austerity. And it's 
from the, the from the budget perspective is not supported because the whole not these institutions these three ones but the whole bunch of institutions autonomous institutions we have they do not have a significant share of the budget. So even though if you disappear all of them, you will not change anything of the challenges we're facing right now in public finance. So it appears to me that the, the real incentive or um, motivation for this initiative is totally different. And it's more about authority, um, weakening counterbalances and building these vertical structure. I think that uh, we are going to pay, if it happens, we're going to pay a high price because these institutions not only have benefits in the government, it also have been a lot of benefits in the economy. Um, I think that we're going to lose a lot of specialization. And of course, um, the certainty of how the um, decisions are going to be made in Mexico. So it might actually um build above all the uh fear that many investors have in mexico of how institutional weaknesses is going to affect the decisions uh for money and in the economy so i think that um, um we have to be very aware of such movements and such initiatives still in, in this point of big reform states i know mexico Evalo was directly involved in the discussion the sistema nacional anti corruption discussion zimco as well what is happening now what, what's the future of esenia uh, is it is it done what is your your view on that well i think that um you know that we are uh facing a completely different um you know, <laughs> context, institutional context, and also the perspective of the new government towards um, how to tackle corruption. You know, that uh, since the, 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 um, the recommendations of the president when he was a candidate, th there was not real project to really strengthen uh, the institutions, to work for the independence of the institutions, and all of the mechanisms that we've been mentioning, uh, not even in the uh, in the side of procurement. Procurement is one part of the the whole corruption happening, and it's incredible that even with the austerity narrative, we are not really um, they are not really tackling um, the, the 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 reform for procurement. They are not building the instruments that we need. So we feel that. Uh, we are very, very far from having a good discussion on the topic and to actually put uh, to work the anti-corruption system that was designed the last uh, term. Uh, we, we think that uh, that project is not relevant to the um, executive power right now and uh, well, and to the whole government. So um, the main steps that had to be taken in order to put it to work haven't been taken. So it's totally in this moment, I would say, if not dead in a coma, you know? And um, so, so um, also, you know, that the public uh, narrative of the president has also been very, um, uh, he doesn't trust in the, in, in the, in the role that uh, civil society uh, has in a society and, and in the case specifically of Mexico. So we think it's, uh, it's hard to, to get to work as we did in, in past times. Um, these teams that were um, integrated by people from the government, civil society, even international organizations uh, to put in place uh, designs and, and um, to discuss initiatives or reforms, I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that collaboration. And I'm, I'm not meaning that they were perfect in the past, not at all. It was always very hard for us to have a place in the table. But I think that now we are having a harder time for it. Pablo, I, I want to ask you about Congress and more specifically about the new legislation regarding tax fraud. Mexico passed some pretty draconian laws on tax fraud under the national security law. Uh, and now the state has the power to seize assets uh, and basically asset forfeiture even before a judicial sentence. 
Um, of course, there's huge pressure in Mexico to act, not only because of corruption, but also because of the narcos is a way for the state to fight drug cartels. Um, what are the risks over the long term? Is, is this terrible news for the rule of law in Mexico? Or do you think that it's a necessary measure that could you know, improve the, the, the state's capacity to, to fight corruption? Well, uh, I think that all of legal reforms in every country do not happen in a vacuum. You have to analyze the context. And of course, uh, asset forfeiture and asset recovery are huge topics in anti-corruption. And the recommendations are always you need to be more flexible within the, the proceedings in order to actually get uh, to the assets before they flee the country, for example. So, uh, when this, all of these reforms happened, there was a really strong push of government trying to publicize that it was actually an international recommendation uh, for anti-money laundering efforts. And nonetheless, we've seen repeatedly and throughout not only this topic, but also the topics that, that Mariana and Francisco were discussing uh, in the, uh, recently, is that we, we need to take into account the discretionary powers with the, uh, within government and also the lack of checks and balances. If you have sound institutions that uh, have the proper checks and balances that cannot be captured either by economic interests or political interests, then these reforms would not be as bad as they seem in a country where actually uh, there are no no uh, checks and balances in in, the, in how the executive at least works, and also where the economic interests behind can really easily get, uh, capture an agency. Therefore, uh, I think that in Mexico, these reforms are a really bad sign and they could be used as an intimidation or as uh, political targeting some uh, uncomfortable characters. And we've seen that the anti-corruption institutions have been uh, being used to that, to do that. Uh, in the major cases we were discussing, one, one that we did not discuss was the former Supreme Justice uh, Medina Mora where the financial intelligence unit started an investigation, announced it, and once the, the uh, minister resigned, then the investigation stopped. That's also the risk with this sort of, of reforms, that they will be used only to intimidate, to uh, start targeting opposition, but that actual crimes, actual investigations won't happen from that. So in terms of checks and balances, Mexico is a really complex federal system, right? And uh, Francisco, what is your view on the states, right? The states have always been a huge part of the problem of corruption in Mexico. We've seen a wave of scandals involving governors a few years ago, but still, until this day, governors are being investigated. We have several corruption case, uh, scandals involving uh, sitting governors. Um, and also after the 2018 election, you had a new dynamic where many of the governors are from the president's party. Um, is there, has anything changed or what, is there a new equilibrium? How, how is the situation for the, the governor's level? Yes, actually one of the issues we've run into again and again when we carry out political and corruption risk assessments across Mexico has been that in the past few years, in a lot of states and even major cities, the political elite from before Morena even existed to simply changed colors and changed political parties and aligned itself with the consensus under Morena, but did not really change its practices or, or even if there was a slight change of the guard, it was much more subtle than, than the developments of 2018 and 2019 would suggest. And from the perspective of the private sector, this was this gives a lot more complications to how companies can consider going into specific local context in, across Mexico and know what they're what they're running into in terms of both political risk and also any corrupt practices. Um, one of the main things that we've seen here has to do with how asset forfeiture and, and asset recovery are in general very uh, important parts of anti-corruption reform. And, in, and usually their objective is to give more certainty to how these cases are carried out and get, and get more clarity as to what happens with, with these assets. However, what we see in Mexico is the opposite of that. And, and 
what this leads into is a need for much more careful research and much more careful analysis of almost down to the specific project to see how they might, how they might interact with the current government. We're starting to receive questions from the, the participants. Uh, if you're joining us via WebEx, you can ask questions through the chat box. If you're seeing us on social media, uh, tag us at ASCOA or America's Quarterly. There's one question. Let me start with Pablo. Uh, can we imagine a world in which the AG pushes forward uh, with a major anti-corruption case without the president's blessing? Would Gets Manero investigate someone for real without the blessing of AMLO? Pablo, what do you think? Um, I think it's a, a really difficult world to imagine. It's been interesting because the attorney general and the president have remained actually pretty separate, at least in, in the media, in the public discourse. Um, but what we've seen is that there's also a, some sort of a power struggle between Santiago Nieto in the Financial Intelligence Unit and, and Gert Manero. And most of the investigations that uh, Santiago Nieto starts are not actually followed through uh, with Gertz Manero. But it's, it's really difficult to see that even though uh, legally and institutionally there's this uh, independence from the attorney general to the president, in, in a, let's say that in a country where the president not only remains pretty popular, but also controls uh, some parts of, of both uh, cameras in the Congress, it is really difficult to see uh, anybody within the public administration to start doing things without the, the president's blessing. I think that it would be something really, really uh, let's say, uh, strange if that happens. And of course, if it does happen, it would be really uh, naive to think that López Obrador would not try to do something to stop it. And specifically on this, this the issue that you mentioned, the dispute between Getz Manero and, and Santiago Nieto, what is the main reason they're fighting? I mean, the fight has become public in some occasions with basically um, Getz accusing Santiago of violating the process. Um, like, do you think this this is changing or, you know, are we seeing a more peaceful moment between the two of them? What are the risks? Well, uh, at least we've not seen this fight uh, grow or at least it had, it had stagnated in the past. Also, the, the FIU and also the Attorney General have remained pretty silent during the past months. Of course, the, the global pandemic has also a lot to do with that. But um, the the reason behind that struggle was the protagonism that Santiago Nieto was having. I, I that's at least the the hint that I was given in the media, and also that this uh, need to publicize everything he was doing could jeopardize the investigations of the Attorney General because of of due process. That's at least the reasons behind that. Uh, I don't know if there's any more uh, on the back scenes, but uh, it is worrisome. That the financial that the financial intelligence unit, which has been the institution that has been more participant, at least or more salient in the fight against corruption with Lopez Obrador, is not really cooperating with the attorney general. Mariana, we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, and I see there are a few questions about this. Uh, and by the way, if you want to ask a question through the social media. Through our social media platforms, I was reminded here, use a hashtag CCC index and we'll be able to see you. Mariana, COVID-19, uh, we're seeing cases uh, exploding in, in Mexico, uh, a very controversial policy uh, from, from AMLO personally. What are the impacts on the anti-corruption space, both in terms of scarcity of resources for enforcement agencies, but also new opportunities for corruption? Um, how, how do you see this? Yes, I, I definitely think that those are, um, I mean, we, we're getting all the factors to, again, make the problem much more difficult to solve and, and a bigger problem, problem, because I would add to the least this context about an emergency. So everything it can be justified with the emergency. You know, it's like people are dying. We need to do that. This is fast. So if you go out with the topic of anti-corruption or, you know, guys, we need to uh, think on the corruption, it's like 
this is an emergency. We cannot think on corruption. So corruption um, stopped to be like a, such an important topic. And uh, we, we've seen also uh, movements from, from the uh, different executives uh, from uh, some states, but uh, from the federal president that we, um, uh, excuse me, to gain power in the, in the um, management or control of the budget, for example. Uh, so with the um, excuse of the emergency, now we think we don't need to uh, go to the Congress and discuss some budget issues, you know. And uh, so, so we think that uh, also this agenda about gaining power and weakening the counterbalances is getting more fuel. Um, the cuts are definitely out of order because um, we've seen, for example, with the World Health Organization, um, it has a, a good registry of how these um, budget cuts are happening in the administrative costs, for example, in different governments. And I've seen that 30% of the administrative costs have been one of the highest. In Mexico, we just have a, a proposal, well, a, a decree with 75% of cuts in, in important um, um, ex administrative expenditures. So I see that um, it's it's getting very, very, um, the space is shrinking in order to tackle corruption, to talk about the topic. And um, I'm afraid that also with the uh, emergency, um, the emergency, we, the, the government needs to do a lot of direct contracts in the procurement side. So, so I think we're going to see a lot of corruption in that side. And we already have seen uh, some journal, some um, reports on that from the um, from journalists, you know. So I, I think that uh, it's going to be very, very frequent. And um, <laughs> a higher distance to get there where we need to be. Francisco, I know you work a lot with companies and, and you know, COVID-19 is also a huge topic for compliance uh, in Mexico. What are your thoughts on kind of the new, the new risks? Well, as Mariana mentioned, the risks for corruption are extremely high at this point because of the crisis and because of the, the way we are almost obligated to prioritize certain issues ahead of others because of the emergency. Um, in one important thing to keep in mind here, uh, especially from the, from the perspective of compliance, is that we, uh, we as analysts and also companies have to make the extra effort to identify what corruption actually is, what, what it actually represents, and distinguish that from issues that are may, may be called corruption, such as uh, excessive spending in the government or the contents of specific sanitary measures, when in reality, the impact of, cor of corruption has more to do with the strength of institutions and how they might function in the future, and especially whether it, as, as investors or as citizens, we can count on institutions to do what they're meant to do. Um, especially uh, things like the premature reopening of the economy are some contexts where there are uh, accusations of this being the product of corruption. And this type of, of discussion derails actual anti-corruption efforts, which have very real implications for both the government itself and how it can carry out its own plans, and also the predictability of institutions that is so hugely important for companies. And we have we have a question here from a corporate member asking if we had cases of corruption involving uh, the purchase of products and services to combat the pandemic. And the answer is yes, right, Francisco? If you could talk a little bit about what we actually were seeing in Mexico already, you know, cases involving procurement. Um, can you talk a little bit about them and, and why they're happening? Yes, definitely. Uh, this all boils down to what Mariana was explaining about how the crisis situation makes decisions uh, much more urgent and it makes processes seemingly optional. 
So we are seeing cases right now, none of them investigated in depth. That's That stage is probably not going to happen until the medium or longer term when hopefully the situation is far enough behind us that we can direct institutions that investigate these issues. But there are definitely situations in Mexico and abroad where there are irregularities in, in the delivery of contracts and the purchase of medical equipment in the uh, um, in the carrying out of contracts related to, for example, the implementation of security measures related to, to the pandemic. These things are coming up right now in public discussion, but they are not being investigated because it's still happening, right? You, you can't really investigate a, a case or a scandal in, in real time. But yes, that, that is a, something that is happening. Also, this has created a, a huge demand for monitoring services for um, the and for specific investigations into companies or into suppliers that that are seeing more business because of the pandemic. So yes, it, it's it's very much a, a relevant situation right now. So one, one of the goals of the index, if not the most important one, it's it, we're not doing this to single out countries or to denounce them or anything like that. Our ultimate goal is really to foster a policy-driven debate about anti-corruption, right? About you know, what reforms are needed, what areas need to need improvement, you know, areas where the countries are doing okay or well. Um, there's an interesting question here in that sense, uh, which is if you had Pablo, one hour with AMLO, and he would try to convince him, you know, three major things that he should do, either put a bill in Congress or, you know, implement an administrative change. What do you think are the top three priorities here, policy-wise, for, for Mexico that can really make a difference? Well, that, that's a tough question, especially talking with AMLO. It is very tough. <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's very tough. Yes, uh, well, the, the first thing that, that should be taken into consideration uh, for policy recommendations is that we need to take political will out of the equation. And that would be really uh, a hard uh, sale for, for me talking to Amla, right? But we, we need to, to take it out of the question and, and start focusing on giving, uh, especially special anti-corruption prosecutors, uh, both federal and the states, the necessary resources for them to really work. Because in some states, even if there is political will, these institutions lack of the personnel, of the specialization, of the instruments, of the access of information to actually build a case. So we've seen it in Nuevo León, we've seen it in Chihuahua, that even though governors are actually fighting and really struggling to uh, build a case toward a former governor, and even though they have a lot of evidence, it is really hard to uh, build the case in order for it to stand a judicial review. So the most important thing for me right now, it's uh, giving these institutions the right equipment, the right instruments, the specialization. Mariana mentioned it in the beginning. Also, uh, the, the public service needs to be way more professional and specialized. And second, uh, also uh, a procurement policy that starts focusing on economic competition and on prevention and also on using uh, data and technology to prevent and to detect corruption. And right now, the, the procurement policy of uh, President Lopez Obrador has been uh, really disappointing because even though he vowed to lower the, the number of direct awards that, that the government would give, we have not seen this promise uh, follow through. So those two would be uh, my main points in my conversation with the president. Mariana, what, what would you add to this list? Um, what is like the most important things in terms of homework for Mexico and you know, big institutional reforms? And also, you know, we have kind of a roadmap already with the national anti-corruption system, right? It doesn't have to be something completely new. What would be your top two or top three policies? You have to unmute your your your. You have to unmute your mic. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I agree with Pablo in that the first thing, and if 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 governments and leaders do not agree with that, 
uh, I'm afraid we're not going to move any forward, is to uh, separate politics from um, the, the, the objectives and the instruments and the, all the inputs that institutions need to really get forward with their objectives. So in order to tackle corruption. So um, second, I would say that we need to also professionalize police forces. It's very important. Like one part of rule of law that is very, very weakened right now is in, in that area. So um, please, the, the police forces do not get the salary they need to take. They don't have the compensation. They are not professional and they don't, they have very, very low performance. So I think this is a key thing and this thing cannot be done without um, a better coordination with the social, with the local governments. So we need a much better coordination with the states and the municipalities in this aspect, and we need funding for that. So this takes me to the second point, which is a fiscal reform. We are facing a terrible financial situation in the government right now. And uh, with, we were facing that since some time ago, but with COVID it's gonna be very, very hard in that part to get forward with um, reforms or, or new ways of doing things. So um, I think that instead of just um, going with very draconian laws, as you said before, uh, for um, tackling this problem with the tax fraud that is very frequent, frequent and high in Mexico, the efficiency of um, tax income in Mexico is, for example, for the VAT tax is the lowest in Latin America. And I think that the way they are putting the things for getting better in that side is not going to provide um, the resources they are looking for. So they really need to go towards other ways of getting the money. We need a serious fiscal reform um, to give the state um, the resources we need to move forward in the justice system, in the anti-corruption system, and of course, in the package of social benefits because all of these um, entitle the need of a more just, uh, a Mexico uh, with, um, with more, you know, to achieve a country with more justice for everyone. So I think that I would say police, fiscal reform and counterbalances, to strengthen counterbalances. There's, there's one interesting question here. Um, basically saying that we usually discuss uh, grand corruption, like big cases involving Pemex and other organizations, and we don't talk much about corruption in the educational system in Mexico, which is a big problem. And also I would add in the healthcare system, and now with the pandemic, it's even more critical. Uh, and this is of course the, 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 the corruption that affects the, the most vulnerable, right? Uh, mainly poor people, women, children, elders, um, what is what needs to be done on both fronts, education and healthcare, Mariana? Is there you you spoke about how um, discretionary spending has increased in Mexico under AMLO? Is it a matter of having better government procurement? But what else needs to be done to reduce corruption in education and healthcare? Well, um, it's very important the. The part of the money that goes from the federation to the states, we have to work on the incentives with that money. We have very uh, not a lot of money with um, that it's given with under conditions to the states. You know, we do not foster their performance. We just um, a lot of the money goes with no conditions with no accountability. We need to change that. We need a lot of change in that, in the way we're giving the money to the states. So, um, because the money, the transfers that the government gives to the local governments are not only a tool for financing activities, they are a tool for fostering performance. But we do not use instruments to condition 
uh, the money to accountability results and the accomplishment of milestones. And those conditions are very important in different uh, countries in the world, for example, in the US. So we need to, um, to use that instrument more strategically so we can have, uh, for example, to foster capacity in the local governments and make the different and, and, and make a difference in the money that we give to governments that achieve the milestones and have results towards the governments that they don't have accountability, they don't, they don't achieve anything and they don't have results. So we now we sometimes give more money to governments that they still haven't uh, delivered the proper registries to the superior audit institution. That happened with uh, Veracruz last past term. Veracruz was uh, missing a lot of registries of where the money is, uh, money that the federal government sent. And the next year they give, gave more money to Veracruz. So they never like punish or they never also um, encourage governments with, with uh, maybe um, more transfers uh, according to their performance. So we need to achieve that. We need also to have digital platforms and to start um, estimating costs of services. We do not give the transfers with the cost of services. So we might be giving more money that they need and to other governments, we might be um, giving less money. So with no accountability, that doesn't work. We really need to know how much the health services um, are costing to the different states and municipalities. So. Um, those are one of the changes we need to achieve and also to foster the, um, the effort that the local and state governments do to tax their citizens because they uh, contribute very, very little to the whole bag of money. Um, around 89% of their income comes from the Federation and that is very out of the world standard. For a federal country like Mexico, um, we expect like at least they need to provide 20%, for example, of the of the money. So, uh, and that is very, uh, it's proven in the literature and in with the international organizations that corruption comes in countries where governments do not tax properly their citizens because then accountability is very weak. So, um, so I think that we need to work a lot on that and also to provide to the people um, a similar coverage of benefits in the case of health benefits. We still have these differences in, this, in, in the people that the government invests more in the people that work in the, inform, in the formal economy, which is people that have higher salaries than people that work in the informal sector. They get less benefits in the, in the health system. So we need to, uh, raise the investment in the people that are in the informal economy to reduce the inequality this is um, this is um, making among Mexicans. Unfortunately, we ran out of time here, but let me end by thank you a lot. Uh, all of you who participated here as speakers, everyone who joined. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to have this discussion with you. Congratulations on your work. Uh, also pushing for, you know, better tools to fight corruption in Mexico. I want to remind everyone we're going to have a panel on anti-corruption in Brazil next week on Wednesday, uh, 9 a.m. East and the following week on Peru. Um, so stay tuned and thank you again. Bye-bye, everyone.